and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother into the temple. Previously, de previously de coming to us with Urban Mages, now coming to us with its first proper expansion, Addendum Arcanum. The one and only Max Jowett. How are you doing today, man? Hello, I'm doing good, thanks. How's yourself? Good. Um, Mother Nature has been freebasing again over the over the last week with all the thunderstorms. Hello. It. Oh, not not again. Jeez, I cannot catch a break with this. Okay. Okay, I think the mic cut. Yeah. I've had I've had that issue from t from time to time. But what I was saying is that I think Mother Nature has been, has been on a bit more of the drugs with the on and off thunderstorms for the last week. Oof, yeah, that'd do it. I mean, like last time we did it, we kind of had like cursed audio issues as well, I think. Technology, it likes to give us the middle finger. <laughs> uh, honestly, I'm just kind of relieved that your opening spiel starts off with like the shit show because I was about to ask like, oh, we thought on this stream. All right, brilliant. We're gonna let's fucking go. Yeah. Well, I ca I call it that because I never I never expect things to go as planned. A uh, case in point. Mm -hmm. Curse you, nature. With and but e even with that, there's but I I've had a few things to keep to certainly keep me busy. Um. Okay. Uh. Is it happening again? Um, it looks like it is. That was that was weird, and I didn't I didn't even touch anything. But yeah, it's there's there's been quite a few things that have happened in the two years since I had you on the temple last, um, mm. when you were when you were kickstarting the original Urban Mages. And yeah, it's been a pretty eventful two years. Yeah. And with uh, when it comes to when it comes to this particular expansion, Addendum Arcanum, was were th were the concepts here things that you had planned for the original book that di but um there wasn't any room or was this a case where the where the um where the ideas came after the core book had finished? Honestly kind of a mixture of both because, you know, this is a... The original Urban Mages was basically a game I designed at first, like, play with my friends. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really get serious about the thought of publishing it until, like, I think quite a few of them asked if they could borrow the rules to GM it themselves. But, like, after spending years and years and years just tinkering and fidgeting in every single campaign going, like, ooh, I could fix this, I could improve this, I could add this, eventually you hit a point where it's like, okay, look, you've got to get this out the door. you got to, like, draw a line under this project, or you will just be tinkering with this thing forever. Mm -hmm. So, Addendum Arcanum, a lot of it is basically the stuff that, you know, I wanted to add, but, you know, I didn't have time to fully playtest to my satisfaction. I can, I can certainly get that. Now, with that, with that in mind, was, was it a was it a case? What would be one of the big examples of a, of a case where you had kind you had kind of hit the threshold where, where this needed to be, its own, where it needed to be its own um, its own beast. Instead instead of just like instead of just like a add on or an, or an errata. I think the big one is definitely an entirely new subsystem for the game, mm. something that I like to call spell mods, where the basic idea of them is you can spend one XP 
experience point to kind of empower, modify, or just change the way a spell works. Mm -hmm. I've made sure to include like one mod for every spell in the game, yeah, just to kind of make sure that everyone gets on the fun. But it's a case of mm, one, I just want to make sure that you know they all work quite decently, and two, I want to make sure that you know everything got represented, but some ideas came more naturally to me than others. Would you say that spell mods are a, are a halfway point between um, the between a normal between a normal spell use and um, uh, dark side? Because you did have that in the core in the core book as far as modifying spell effects. Yes. It kind of a lot of the cases it's more dark side is pretty much you know the charging a spell to the absolute uppermost absurd limit. Spell mod is more kind of a sideways alteration. So, for example, the take enchantment, for example, the spell that lets you take a regular item and turn it into a magical item. Mm -hmm. The dark side version of that basically turns you into Sauron, for lack of a better word. <laughs> Yeah. You know, you have a magical item that, you know, really makes someone powerful, like, you know, grants them magic who didn't have it before, but, you know, you also get to control them. <laughs> Whereas the spell mod for enchantment that I'm including in Addendum Arcanum, that gives you the ability to sort of temporarily bring an object to life. Mm -hmm. Or another thing that spell mods can do, which I'm pretty excited by, is basically it's a uh, if you have two different spells you can do a completely new effect that combines them together mm -hmm. and i i don't i suppose this i suppose something like that benefits from the fact that there's not a whole lot of crunch when it comes to these spells that you have mm. since otherwise i could see the idea of um spell spell fusion in that sense to be a bit of a nightmare Oh, yeah, exactly. And the great thing about an expansion is, you know, you can include, like, the weirder, more crunch-heavy stuff that, you know, wouldn't necessarily be kosher in a core rulebook. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the examples of combining spells together is, you know, if you have Blast, the basic attack spell, and Kinesis, the moving stuff around spell, mm -hmm. you can get a spell mod that combines them into Kinetic Shove, where when you blast someone, you can spend extra MP to sort of move them around, which can have a whole variety of extra effects. Oh yeah, and with so it, it I suppose it'd be tempting to compare to compare spell mods to meta magic, but that but I feel like with how you're describing it, there's a bit more to it than um that. And some of them just get like oddly specific. Mm -hmm. For example, there's a couple of spell mods that are basically ways that when it came to playtesting, I noticed people wanted to use spells or like assumed they worked in a particular way. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, let's make a spell mod that allows them to basically make the spell works how they assumed it did. So one example that springs to mind is the divination spell. Basically, the spell that lets you learn information about something. Normally, the way that works is you can ask a question that directly relates to the theme to your magic, or you establish like a symbolic connection between your theme and the thing you want to ask about. Mm -hmm. But I have had players who are like, oh, well, I'm playing a plant mage, so presumably that means I can like read tea leaves. Now I'm like, Okay, that's not how the spell works, but I can see why someone would reach that conclusion. Yeah. So the divination spell mod, fortune telling, basically lets you do that, but it's kind of limited by the idea that, you know, it's like, well, okay, there needs to be a commonly recognized form of fortune telling that's related to your purview. Mm -hmm. So like a card mage drawing tarot cards or something like that. Yeah. Now, with 
With that in, with that in mind, since you t since we talked about combining spells earlier, and spell fusion is something that's and just fusion in general is something that's been tried in in RPGs, but there's always a big ass wall of text in a lot in a lot of cases where it's done. Um, how would spell how would spell combination work within urban mages? The uh, basic idea is, you know, I wanted to like, like I said, have one mod that applies to every spell in the game. But I'm thinking, you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to start off with one spell mod for each. And then if I want to like release future expansions, then I could add more spell mods to those if I come up with other ideas for them. But I have tried to get like fairly creative with the ones that I'm starting out with. For example, I wanted the spell mod that combined construct and shape shifting to kind of do something pretty wild. Because mm -hmm. normally shape shifting lets you like change your appearance, and construct kind of lets you create objects. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, what if you had a spell mod that merged those both together, and you basically turned yourself into the liquid metal terminator? Or I'm I'm pretty sh I'm pretty sure someone could interpret this in order to create create that same na that same nanite um, power armor that you had iron that you had Iron Man having in the let in the last two good uh, Marvel movies. Exactly. Like I'd I admit, like I was also a little bit inspired by one of my players who decided to basically play a sentient blob of slime. It's every, it's, a fun every it's every player's worst nightmare, a living, talking, gelatinous cube. Oh, Gumball was precious. We all loved him. <laughs> That's but the at, he was called Gumball? Yeah. But okay. at one point, Gumball kind of had like the construct spell that allows them to, you know, make stuff out of slime. And then they're like, hey, so because I'm made out of slime, <laughs> can I shape myself into an object? Like, that never would have occurred to me, but sure, I don't see why not. <laughs> so I'm like... The, this is the advantage of how, of how broad... The okay, what if I, like, let is. other people get in on that nonsense? <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm fairly I'm fairly certain if, if somebody wanted to... Um... Wanted to... I could I could see some I could see somebody okay, doing. Okay, so some... if there's a long silence, I'm just going to assume something has gone wrong with Mildred Mike technology being what it is, giving us the middle finger, etc. And you would be correct. Hey. But it's using um using bla using blast and potions to. Uh, should we have like a protocol if that happens again? Um. Like I just keep blathering to fill up time. Yeah, I suppose that I suppose that will work. Um, we can make this work. We can adapt. We can improvise. We can overcome. Th to throw one to throw one of, one of my favorite gimmicks in my third edition days. Alchemist? Like, just throwing flasks of, like, acid or shit. <laughs> Hell yeah, like, area control? Love that stuff. ripping off um looney tunes shorts like you like using like using a a um, portable hole that w that was hidden with a pe with a camouflage piece of cloth you know so somebody runs in then they fall in the hole yes uh, full bugs bunny on them yeah yes the the good old fake wall has has been used more than once as well as um my gm letting me get away with a spell call, called summon anvil which 
if you've seen an anvil in in a cart in, a, in any cartoon that Chuck Jones did, you know how this goes. Oh, uh, because it's but not see, it's not going uh, to make it appear from out of nowhere right next to me. You're gonna have to wonder about what that falling noise is. Okay, that just screams bad to me. <laughs> that feels like something they ought to already have, you know. Oh. I mean, there, the, that's there's kind of one of the things that I'm kind of why I was excited to kind of get this thing, uh, Dendam Arcane, out there. Yeah. Because it's like, you know, I've already just pitched the idea of combining spells and you've already come up with stuff. Yeah. Um, and that tells me, like, okay, I'm onto something good here. Mm hmm. Uh, or, or, um, or some, or somebody using, somebody using, um, Somebody using divination and just just use that again bl blast to um ca to um cast in the future. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Because okay, I'll admit the potions mod that I do have in the book right now mm -hmm. was created to. Okay, this is like an extremely nerdy thing for me, but I always kind of like the idea that, at least when it comes to the Magic Out of the Core rulebook, um, the PC mages and the NPC mages basically have access to the same suite of abilities. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, hold on. The problem with the way potions are built now is that it would... It's, it's kind of impossible with the rules as written to make someone who like has a potion shop who just, like, has a ton of them that they can sell to people. Mm. And yeah, what's an, that's like a fantasy archetype. you got to have that represented somehow. Or if, so, even the, motion, mo, even the um, potion seller as an adventure, v adventurer who's, who's trying to diversify, hit, diversify his stuff or experiment with the potions he's making. Yes, exactly. You see my vision. Mm -hmm. So the spell mod for potions there is basically gives the option to mass produce a particular potion. Where it's like, okay, it's a lower quality than the other ones, but you can make as many as you want. Mm -hmm. And the import the important part the important part when it comes to when it comes to that is get is giving the giving the option so that there's ro there's room for people to come up with crazy ideas since urban mages at at the end of the day when you're do it when you're doing it that you can use spells to do theoretically just about anything having that level of creativity is going to be is going to be something that should be encouraged yes precisely i feel that the game really thrives on player creativity cuz like okay i have this pet theory which is you know when you compare a book to a movie like, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that movies can do that books can't. But conversely, books are pretty much unmatched when it comes to, like, really getting into a character's head. Like, mm -hmm. you can read, like, what they're thinking about everything at all times. And, you know, I'd say that that's, like, a unique strength for the medium. You know, that's why when people go to see a movie adaptation of the book, they always say, like, oh, the book was so much better. Conversely, I think when you compare... TTRPGs to video games, a unique strength for the medium is that, you know, because it isn't like pre written and code and stuff, you can literally just go, like, yeah, sure, fuck it, that can happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I've, I've, joke, I've jokingly said in, on multiple occasions, nobody plays Uno as written. Oh, yeah, I discovered that recently. <laughs> Everyone has their own rules and they don't even know it. Well, the designers of Uno certainly know it, since I remember I remember a I remember a um, a version of Uno that I came across that had a bunch of users had a bunch of fan submitted house rules within within the package. I was like they they are they are they are on to the whole thing. Ah, <laughs> oh, bless. It's kind of like when the Pokemon trading card trading card game came out when I was a kid. Yep. None of us played it. Rules is written. <laughs> probably, pro probably because everybody was trying to play things like the uh, games. But also, also, if I'm be if I'm being honest, I w I wasn't sure if that whole 
the the energy thing in that in that card game was too MTG for me. Mm. If you if Whereas, you catch my, you know, like if you're like eight years old, it's like, ooh, I got the shiny Charizard, I win. <laughs> yeah, that that's how card games work, right? <laughs> I mean, everybody everybody wants to or doesn't want to get the Joker, depending on which card game you're playing. Um, but given now, given some of the, given some of the other optional rules, you're you're talking about about different ways to handle health, experience, and mana. So let's get into that. When it comes to health, what what would some of the optional rules that you have planned? Um, change in regards to health okay so the big optional and one it basically makes damage even more devastating for pcs and npcs alike mm -hmm. but there's actually a bit of a backstory behind this one because like okay i will admit just between you and me Okay, so everyone who's listening to this, like, promise to keep this secret. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're all friends here, right? We're all friends here, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. The damage rules that I'm introducing in Addendum Arcanum are probably how I would run damage now, a few years after Mages have come out. Mm -hmm. Like, this would be my preferred ruling. And the big reason for that is because it basically syncs up the restoring mana target numbers with the health save numbers. Mm -hmm. I I can I can certainly get that, and it's it's it is. I know that some people romanticize high damage or high lethality um, games. But it is important to have to have the option to do power fantasy if you want to, or do um, a more a harder approach if need be. Uh. Yeah. Also, just because. Okay. So when I. Oh God! If I go into this, I'll be getting into like a lot of backstory stuff. <laughs> you will be getting the max lore if I explain this. <laughs> Getting getting the lore is part is part and parcel of the of this particular show. So, okay, hell yeah. So, early drafts of the game. You know how Urban Mages uses like the uh, the point collecting table. Yeah. Well, originally I also had another column, which was the point avoiding table, mm -hmm. where you know you got hit and then you rolled to see whether you took. Zero to five damage. Mm. Basically, where so the opposite of the point collecting table, where basically the higher you roll, the less points you lose. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when I was working on Urban Mages, it like I said, you know, it started out just like a game I was running for my friends for fun. Then I was, I think, in the extremely lucky to be position to sort of be noticed and picked up by a small indie publisher. Who, you know, they loved it, but they told me they wanted it to be twice as long. Mm -hmm. So I bulked out the book, really put my heart and soul into it. And then, just as we were getting ready to publish, the company shuts down. Oof. But, you know, like, obviously, the guy in charge, he's a cool dude, you know. He didn't want to leave me high and dry. So he basically recommended me to a friend of his who kind of like ran his own little small indie publishing thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm not going to name names, you know, like protect the innocent and all that. And years later, he did admit to me that he was kind of in like a pretty bad mood at the time. And that, you know, he might have been taking out of me just a little bit. But, you know, this is a guy who has, like, a very different game design philosophy. 
So first thing he asks for when he I kind of present him my game is he's kind of going, oh, well, uh, can you sort of like give me an abridged summary of how the mechanics work? And I'm like, yeah, sure, fair enough. So I do make like a short document that basically gives the cliff notes. Then he reads this, and he basically has, based on the cliff notes, dozens of incredibly radical changes he wants to make. A lot of them without realizing either he's trying to fix a problem that isn't that I haven't encountered in all the times we've been running this thing, or proposing things that would cause more problems that he couldn't possibly be aware of. But, you know, it's like, okay, well, you know, this is my chance to get published, so I'm going to be polite about this, I'm going to be professional, and I'm going to address each of these criticisms one at a time. Mm -hmm. And I was able to kind of make a convincing argument for, I'd say, like, the vast majority of them. But one of the big criticisms that he did have was about the health system. Saying that with the difficulty and the point collecting and the point avoiding, he thought it was kind of hard to memorize all that. And that was one of the points where I had to concede, yeah, no, he's right about that one. Like, it makes sense, there's a symmetry to it, but in all the years I've been practicing, I've never been able to remember it at the top of my head. But, that, like, I don't know why the same numbers, but in the opposite order, is hard to remember. You know, like, I'm sure someone smarter than me can sort of explain it, but, you know, yeah, hit a point where it's like, okay, yeah, this... It doesn't work. I don't know why it doesn't work, but it doesn't, so therefore there's room for improvement. Mm -hmm. So that's when I kind of implemented a new system, where it's like, okay, well, in that case, rather than having six possible results that determine how much HP you lose, we could probably trim it down to three. You know, there's the... Maybe like the one level where you lose zero hit points if you get like a 15, the highest you can possibly roll. Mm -hmm. Then one point if you hit an 11. And then you lose free HP if you roll anything less than that. Yeah. My thinking being like, well, okay, if you've got six hit points and you've just lost three, that's half your health gone. Which functionally isn't that much different from if you lose like four or five hit points. Mm -hmm. Right, like I've either way, you know, you're you can endure, you can take the same amount of hits, basically. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that's what I tried to do instead. Then I figured I'd do something kind of similar with fate points. So, not fate points, magic points. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Then I kind of realized in playtesting it that people were... It, when I set the target numbers relatively high, then people start to get into the attitude of like, oh, well, it might as well be an all or nothing then. You either invest or, or you don't. Mm -hmm. Which kind of convinced me, well, okay, when it comes to mana points at least, then... I should kind of change where the target numbers are. And I thought about also changing the target numbers for hit points to kind of align with that. The problem is that would have required more playtesting, which I didn't have time to do if I wanted to get the game out and published. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons I was kind of like eager to work in expansion is it's like, okay, well, I can sneak this into it. <laughs> Like a sneaky patch. <laughs> yeah. Because what? Well, well, that's uh, that's cer that's certainly going to be in, fi in fitting. Um. Now, so, okay, okay. In my defense, mm -hmm. in my defense, I have been playing D and D five E for years. I have never encountered a single group that has ever done XP. 
most of the, most of the time it's um milestone, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like sometimes, you know, it's the optional rules are the things that really catch on. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, well, what the hell? Like, if D and D can get away with that, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that there's. Some, I'm sure that there's some that go go on the hard, hard XP. I'm also sure that there's some who who think that the height of role playing is is um the one is the one where you have to meticulously track all of your five feet rope. Uh. Yeah, I. That is genuine all the gripes I have with not even D and D, but the way it's like positioned in the community. People treat it like it's this universal game that can handle everything when it really isn't. And that's not knocking at it. I think like it's good at what it does, but you know, what it does isn't everything. I've and also it shouldn't be everything. Um when I do my reviews, that's what that's why I refer to my style as as akin to a tailor. Because because I'm well aware that not every game is going to be for everybody, so I'm trying to figure out okay who who's a better fit for this, and I've I've seen that kind of er RPG mindset from GURPS fans just as much, which in all fairness, GURPS being a more universalist game, you could in theory do just about anything with it. But if GURPS was really such a universal system, why are they selling you like a million supplements? Well, in practice, that's the problem is you're going to have to do extra work as a G, as a GM. And huh. this is when you're dealing with the universal games, you're going to have to deal with extra work as the G as a GM. Period. That's not a knock on them. It's just something that has to be acknowledged. And I think when a lot of people say, "Oh, you can run anything in GURPS," they're um not telling the whole story. Yeah, like, I think uh, Fate is probably my go-to example of, like, a universal game. And, and even that then... And its own problems. Exactly. Like, you know, you basically have to most of the time make, design your own magic system for it. You could you could use the magic system that was in the Dresden Files, even though that system was busted. Ah, uh, Wizards was so nutty in that game. Mm-hmm. But you, but um, every and of course of course I've of course I've um at the same time made the joke that Mage the Awakening is a it, or not the Awakening the Ascension is a perfectly balanced balanced game with no exploits whatsoever. <laughs> it's only through practice that I'm able to say that with a straight face. I mean, to be fair. Okay, I know it's like every designer's nightmare, but also getting to break the game every once in a while just is fun and satisfying. Um, I've taken. Yeah, you don't want it to be all the time, yeah, but I've, you know. I've taken what I call the brawl minus approach with my own projects. Oh yeah. Um, that I talked about this in a Q and A I did I did a week ago, but there was a mod for there was a balanced mod for for Smash Brothers Brawl called Brawl Plus. Which tried to ner nerf some of the overpowered stuff, especially Meta Knight. I don't. <laughs> nobody likes Meta Knight in Bra in Brawl. He, he had it coming. He had it coming. <laughs> and um, eventually, eventually, we somebody decided to kind of flip that on its head with a mod called Brawl Minus, which instead of trying to make everyone relatively balanced and bring and bring the um sc bring and scale a lot of stuff back. It went the idea with the idea of let's make everybody stupidly overpowered in zif in different ways. You know what I can respect it because <laughs> basically, if ev to reference Incredibles, if everyone's overpowered, then no one is. Yeah, that's one of the things. Like, okay, so I really, really like the whole deck building roguelike genre of game. Like, you know, Slay the Spire, Legends of Runeterra, that sort of thing. Yeah. Because basically the goal is to make the most busted, game-breaking, <laughs> ridiculous fuck-you combos you possibly can. But then, you know, because it's a roguelike, once you finish the run, you get reset back to zero. Mm -hmm. The game gets to keep being challenging. And... I've um, 
I've, descri I've described the roguelike mindset as a protracted game of chicken. I can see that. I can see that. Yeah, you know, because you at any point in time you have the opportunity to bet to back off. And if you keep if you keep pushing it and you and you end up um you end up getting reset. Well, it was on you because you d because you chose to not back off. You bit off more than you can chew, basically. Mm -hmm. And when, now, with that with that in mind, when it comes to um, the adventure that you're setting up, the high school of of elemental evil, which oh yes, I I appreciate the reference. Thank um, you, thank you. What sort of I'm not going to ask for anything spoiler related. So, what sort of overall tone is is it going for with that adventure? Is it a, is it a case where it's a um sh it's a short sandbox and th and then a act structure for the adventure? Is it more is it more sandbox than um than str than a straight module? How's the advent how's the adventure going to work out? Okay, so the way the adventure works is you're all high schoolers mm -hmm. who just happen to be majors. Like, you know, this isn't a high school for majors. You are majors who happen to be attending a high school. Mm -hmm. And then it gets attacked by a bunch of elemental spirits. Now, your goal is to basically stop them. But you can tackle them in any order you want. And depending on what choices you make during this adventure, you can get three, three endings, maybe four if you count the bad one. Mm -hmm. I and I I could see that. And is would this be an adventure for, for primarily for starting um, mages or for more advanced ones? Uh, this is an adventure for kind of like starting to kind of get people into the game. Mm -hmm. So, one of the things this adventure uses is a series of pre-generated characters. But the reason I think that works in a high school setting is because you already have the stereotypes you can draw on. So, when your options are, oh, you can play the goth kid, their purview is they're the dark mage. Or, you know, you're the neurotic teacher's pet. Uh, your purview is the letter A. Or, you're the geek. Your purview is Dragon Ball Z, spelt with two E's. <laughs> mm -hmm. And your blast allows you to fire um, an attack that's similar to, but legally distinct from, the Kamehameha. But uh, the thing about the about having those pregens is it's pretty much like, oh, I know who that is. And I instantly know who everyone else around the table is playing. Mm -hmm. And it's it's also an easy way to get to get the get the gist and get people right into right into things. Exactly. Especially because Every single time I've run and playtested this adventure, no two parties have solved these things in the same way. Mm -hmm. Which, considering they all like start off with the same or at least a similar toolkit, is pretty wild to me. But also makes me feel like, hey, I've done my job. <laughs> yeah. So with the... now with that in mind, would when it comes to that when it comes to that adventure, is it's since you mentioned going through multiple endings, is it a case where there's going to be some bran some branching points on that adventure? Like it's not a um, crawl. There are branching points there. Mm -hmm. I'll say, okay, I don't want to spoil it, but one of the possible outcomes is basically determined by: Do you guess the plot twist in advance and try to sequence break? And it's like, okay, if your players do that, then this is the ending that plays out. That ma that makes sense. 
Ah. Oh. Thank you. So, Thank you. Now, with with that in with that in mind, when it comes to when it comes to addendum arcanum, um, what are you shooting for as far as the page count? Um, right now we're looking for somewhere between fifty to sixty pages. That that certainly would fit. Like kind of an adventure plus some new mechanics that people can play around with, you know, like the spell mods that we mentioned, uh, new variant optional rules, and some additional powers. Yeah, I could I could certainly see that. And as far as a release window, would you be? Sh I know it. I know it says December on the Kickstarter. Would you be? Uh, that's me that? hedging my bets. Mm -hmm. I could. I could certainly see that. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. It's been a pleasure. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And Thank you for having me on the show. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open Ooh, bar yes. of the internet. Uh, the Kickstarter mm -hmm. is still live. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... We're two thirds of the way to being fully funded, so any support you could throw my way or just mm -hmm. sharing it with anyone who might potentially be interested would be eternally and massively appreciated. Mm -hmm. Of course. And there will be a link in the description to th do this. But until then, on behalf of the Good Brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! Bye!